uh, impacts on the political system on mining. So I'm going to talk about the political results today. So quick overview question, does mineral wealth lead to bad political outcomes? We're going to take data from 1980 to the present. We're going to instrument local mineral wealth with geological deposits, local production, and global prices. So we're going to have the idea that two different mining regions are experiencing different outcomes based on what type of mineral they're sitting on. And we're going to find that mining booms lead to criminal politicians being elected. And there are a number of channels by which that could be happening, which we'll talk about. And we also find some declining electoral competition. We see bigger win margins and increased incumbency advantages. So those are the results. I'll talk about what they mean as we go on. So broad question, could resource wealth be bad for growth? There are about 33 papers talking about different reasons by which this could be the case. At one point, believe it or not, this was considered counterintuitive that natural resource wealth could be bad for growth. Now, uh, the resource curse is almost uh, the conventional wisdom. So I think these are the most common ones. We're mostly looking at rent seeking in this presentation. So why is resource extraction special? Why isn't there a uh, manufacturing curse or a soybean curse? So three characteristics of natural resources that are particularly relevant for today's presentation. Resources are spatially concentrated, which means their ownership is concentrated. So you can have one person owning a, a large, uh, potentially wealth-generating place, which makes it valuable for politicians to sign contracts with that one person. Resources tend to be high fixed cost, low variable cost, and so a government can wait for investment to take place and then try to extract some of the rents that are coming out afterward. And finally, natural resource extraction tends to be highly regulated, which gives government and politicians and bureaucrats an access point to uh, be able to hold up, hold up mine owners. So what we're going to focus on doing is we're going to look in this paper at testing one specific mechanism of the political resource curse. So most of the literature in this area is particularly the historic literature is trying to address this idea of could resource wealth be bad for growth and is trying to say, would Nigeria be better off without oil? Uh, that's, that's a good question, but what you're doing is you're taking all these factors that people have talked about, you're adding up the positive factors, adding up the negative factors, and saying on net, are they positive or on net, are they negative? Uh, I think that it's worth getting into the details as well. It may be that Nigeria is better off with oil than it would be without it, but by changing some of the systems and policies around it, we could make things even better. So we're not looking for a net effect. We're specifically looking for one of the mechanisms of the resource curse, which is that natural resources cause you to elect worse politicians. That's, the, that's what we're going to find. Okay, and then we're going to look at voter behavior. So the context of India, it's a democracy that's particularly relevant because if there's, if there's any consistent, reasonably consistent result from the resource literature. It's that natural resources seem to be better for countries with good institutions, better for democracies, than they are for autocracies or countries with, with worse institutions. So India is a democracy on the good side of the ledger. However, India is institutionally quite weak. There is still quite a lot of corruption there. So how can, you, how can you get a worse politician as a result of a mining boom? We're going to talk about three possible mechanisms. And I think these are the only three possible ways that you can find the particular effect that we're finding. So the starting point is you have a mining boom. Local mineral prices are going up. There are more rents to be had. And so we're going to find, think of this first column as being people who are running for election. And this is the person who's being elected and the red people are going to be criminals. So we have a control group where there's no mining boom, and this is the group with a mining boom. So adverse selection is the first thing that can happen. More criminals can enter politics. And so you have more criminals in the candidate pool, and so you end up having a higher chance of electing a criminal. Okay, you can have election success. You can have no impact on the candidate pool, but for one reason or another, the criminal candidates are more successful at getting elected when a mining boom is taking place. So maybe they're trying harder, maybe they're stealing, the, they're, they're uh, engaging in electoral fraud, or maybe voters are just paying less attention and are electing a worse candidate. And the final possibility is moral hazard. You're electing the same person that you would elect before, but this guy who would have been honest in the absence of all these potential rents is now going to behave criminally once there are more potential rents to be had. I think it's important to disentangle these mechanisms because 
you get very different policy conclusions from which of these is going on. If it's about who you're electing, voter information is going to do a great deal. If it's all about moral hazard, it doesn't matter who you elect, uh, you need to worry about how politicians are behaving and putting checks and balances on what they can do. So the context of mining in India, a uh, lot of different minerals widespread across the country. I'll show you a map in a minute. It only occupies or it only takes up about 2.5% of GDP, but it's very important locally. And in this and the other study that we're doing, we're really focusing just on the regions that are close to, close to mine. So it's small on the aggregate scale, but very important in these areas. It's a mix of private and public ownership moving over, the time, over this time period from public ownership to private ownership. And this is important in terms of figuring out just what we're learning from this study relative to the other studies. In India, taxes and royalties go to state and federal governments only. And you can think of states, Indian states, as countries. There are only 30 states in all of India. There's no local profit sharing. There's nothing official by which mining royalties come back down locally. So unlike some of the previous literatures, which is specifically looking at the effect of politicians having more money, the, a lot of the Brazilian papers are about an oil shock putting money in the political coffers and then seeing how politicians act. We have exactly the opposite here. These politicians don't have any more money to spend officially. No increased government spending locally. There's just the mining activity and the potential for informal uh, contracts to be made between politicians and mine owners. Okay, so by now this is uh, pretty widely widely recognized that when you compare mineral wealth, mineral mineral wealthy areas or mineral rich areas to mineral poor areas, you have a fundamental problem in that just the fact of having a town in a mineral rich area says that that town is going to be very different because towns are located in areas for specific reasons. You might want to put a town at a good port or at a confluence between two rivers. So if you've got a town in the mountains by a coal mine, it's probably going to be missing some advantages of those other towns. So you really don't want to be comparing these two types of places and saying the difference between these places is driven by, driven by some causal effect of natural resources. So what we're going to do is we're only going to look at places that have natural resources that are producing at the beginning of this period that are producing uh, that are extracting minerals from the ground. We're going to define the precise center of where this deposit is using the geological deposit, and that gets us away from uh, some potential endogeneity if we worry that maybe only the functional places are able to get the infrastructure in order for this production to take place. Or it could be the dysfunctional places where the mineral companies want to locate. So by using the geological deposits, we're taking something that's totally exogenous. So with the, the idea is we have production in a broad region, and then we're going to pin that down according to where the deposits are within that region. It's going to be by type of mineral. And then we're going to predict the change in value over time using district production at baseline and the global price change to say, we expect minerals in this area to be becoming more valuable. We expect them in this area to be becoming less valuable. So the natural experiment is we're shocking treatment regions. We're increasing the value of the minerals in the land in the treatment areas. So here's a map of mineral deposits. The circles are mineral deposits colored by the type of mineral they are, and then the shaded areas are a district level production where the darkest areas are producing the most value. So you can see uh, massive dispersion across India. So this is exactly what we want to what we want to find. We're not talking about just one specific area. So we think that this study has a fair amount of external validity in that you have a lot of different political systems, a lot of different wealth levels across across this country, and the same data being collected everywhere. You can also see a lot of deposits in places where there isn't production. These, particularly at the top, are in the very mountainous areas where it's very expensive to get. And so this is uh, what we're going to do. We're going to have two strategies. In one of these, we're going to take all the deposits, and we're just going to look at price shocks in the deposit areas. That's going to get rid of any endogeneity as relates to production. But then we're going to be adding noise in that all those areas in the north that have mineral deposits but aren't actually producing. We're going to be predicting outcomes there where it doesn't really make sense. And then the second thing we're going to do is we're going to map this production to the deposits in the regions that, where we have deposits that map, that match what is being produced. And so now you may worry a little bit about the endogeneity of the baseline production, but we're not, there's no sense in which we're uh, 
treating these areas where nothing's actually happening. Okay, our main outcome data is uh, politician criminality. The specific measure is, is there an open criminal case against this politician? So since 2004, I believe, 2000, maybe 2003, in order to run for any of India's higher offices, you need to submit an affidavit which states a number of things, including your assets, uh, your income in recent years, and most interestingly for us, a list of criminal cases against you. Now in India, you almost only ever have criminal charges filed against you because there's a thousand year backlog in the court system. So this is as far as most of these criminal cases will get. But this law is intended to make this information available to voters. So you can see, you can circle, you know, I am, am not accused of offenses punishable with imprisonment for two years. And of particular interest here, these are the uh, Indian Penal Code sections under which a politician is accused. So this guy has, has uh, criminal charges against him in six different areas. And I looked these up, it was uh, criminal mischief, rioting, 332 was uh, assault of a public official. These tend to be uh, fairly serious, often violent, often violent crimes. And I guess we're not, we, we might worry about underreporting. There's not really any reason anyone would overreport. And even underreporting isn't a huge issue here because you can always dig into the, this, this data, if you're an NGO or if you're an activist, you can go look this stuff up and you can see whether a politician has lied on his affidavit and misreporting this could make you ineligible for election. So there hasn't been huge discussion of these things being misreported. Obviously not all charges are related to actual crimes. So for the most part, people seem to take these data pretty seriously as representative of actual criminal activity. So this is the, this is the classic resource curse specification, or the historical one. We're comparing mining regions to non-mining regions. And the deposit at the top basically says whether it is a dummy for having a large mineral deposit here. So you can see, we actually don't find the average difference between mineral rich areas and mineral poor areas under so, uh, whether you're a criminal, whether you, sorry, whether you have a criminal charge against you, whether you have a serious criminal charge against you, or the number. We do find these politicians report slightly fewer assets. It makes sense these areas are a little bit poorer. Uh, no difference in education. This is whether you've graduated from high school. So now what I'm gonna show you today are the first specifications where we're just taking all the deposits and we're applying a price shock to the deposits. So we're not using production at this point. We've just gotten that data online. So this is showing that a doubling in the value of the mineral that you're, the mineral under the soil of your constituency over a five year period increases the probability of uh, electing a criminal politician by 10%, 10 percentage points, rather. So this is quite high. The baseline level of criminality is about 30% in this sample. This is extremely robust. So we've just got this running using production where we're actually using baseline production and predicting it, and we find very similar effects. Standard, standard errors go way down once you limit to the places that are actually producing. So this is, this is a very robust impact on the politician having a criminal case against him. So you are more likely to be represented by a criminal politician when mining times are good. So we now wanna to try to start decomposing that into adverse selection, electoral success, and moral hazard. So this is what happens to the candidate pool. Now we're looking at the same price shock of doubling the value of the local resource and looking at the share of candidates in the candidate pool facing criminal charges. So uh, positive, not statistically significant, cannot explain like the, the effect, the 10% effect that we're finding here is outside the 95% confidence interval. So there may or may not be something happening in the candidate pool, but it's not enough to explain the full effect that we're finding. Okay, looking at election outcomes, we might wonder, whether uh, voters are paying less, less attention. So we do find that margin here is the win margin of the winning candidate. So elections are becoming less competitive. We don't find an effect on turnout. ENOP is a effective number of parties, inverse Herfindahl of the number of parties. It basically takes, it gives you a sense of the number of parties that actually had a chance to be elected since in Indian elections, you often have 30 parties contesting. So no, it looks like no effect on total number of people and contesting elections, but elections are a little bit less competitive. So not quite sure what to do with this, but incumbents uh, 
whether you consider an incumbent someone who's aligned with the party in control of the government, those are the last two columns, or the local incumbent in a place, they seem to do better. So there is this fall in electoral competition. So where does that leave us? We find you have a more criminal MLA after a mining boom, incumbents are more entrenched, and elections are less competitive, no impact on voter turnout. So where are we in terms of our selection mechanisms? So selection into the candidate pool can't explain the full effect. Moral hazard can't explain this effect either because we're looking at candidates at the time that they contest election. And so if this is actually a moral hazard effect, this guy is going to not be a criminal when he's elected, but then he's gonna engage in criminal behavior once he's been elected. So we'll actually see it in the next period. And so we're putting together a candidate time series right now to have an explicit test of moral hazard. So we can follow the same candidates over time and see when, if elected politicians have been exposed to mining booms, whether that changes their likelihood of engaging in criminal behavior. Okay, so it looks like criminals are winning more elections during, during mining booms. And so we're still, we're still pulling this apart into whether this comes from candidate effort or possibly cheating. Uh, voter indifference, well, we're not finding impacts on turnout. That's probably the best that we can do on that. Or there's a, poss there's a possibility that voters prefer criminal candidates. You, this is, this is uh, you know, something that we're looking into. It could be that criminal candidates are better at getting these mining projects going because there's a million clearances that need to be filed. It takes a long time from when a mineral dis discovery is made to start production. So it just may be that criminal candidates are more able to uh, get these mines running. Now, that again would assume that these are significantly benefiting local communities, which is something that we're trying to answer in our other project. So next steps on this, we want to get to the candidate panel to test the moral hazard. On the question of whether voters could possibly value criminal candidates, well, we can, we can take a look at what criminal candidates do to mineral operations, because we've got this great time series operation on uh, mine production and capital use and labor use. So we can actually have a pretty clear sense of what the impact is the other way. And we also want to look at what happens to local public services. And as some, as some of our other work, we have assembled all this data on what types of public services are being delivered. So we can see, we can see whether you know, voters are really being hurt by these guys or not really. So that's where this is at. Thank you. So thanks a lot. I think they were, this was a, a really interesting paper to read, um, and especially the, the parts that I like uh, with it is that you, I think you do a very good job trying to uh, differentiate these different potential mechanisms uh, that you put into these uh, uh, four categories of uh, three categories of election selection and more hazard. Uh, I do have some comments. Uh, I'll start with uh, some of the interpretation of your results and uh, uh, potential extensions, and then some, some questions on the estimation empirical specification, and then just some, some other minor things on clarifications. I, and I think you actually clarified some of the, the questions I had in your presentation here today, so some of these things uh, won't really be a concern. Uh, but, but So the first thing uh, I started thinking about when reading this paper was, so how should we really think about criminality in this context? Uh, in what way do we expect criminality to be related to political performance? So there are these other papers that focus on corruption, uh, uh, investigating similar mechanisms. So in what way do we think that criminality differs from corruption? Uh, are there uh, other ways that, that, that we could, are, are these uh, results comparable in that way? Uh, so, so I think uh, since you described it might be, be a hassle to, to find that information, but they at least you, you seem to have pretty detail, detailed information about what actual crimes were committed. So um, my suggestion would just be just describe more in detail uh, what the types of crime that these politicians are actually uh, accused of are, and maybe you could do some more heterogeneity analysis on this, on different types of criminal activity that you would think would be uh, um, more relevant, uh, particularly when you're looking at these political outcomes. 
And then in terms of these different mechanisms, uh, your table six results that you show, showed here are that the winners are more likely to be, to be criminals. And one uh, thought that I don't think you can completely rule out is that this effect is uh, explained uh, completely by criminal incumbents. Essentially that, that the incumbents are, are just uh, happen to be more criminal than, than the candidate pool. So, so, and I think you're, uh, uh, it's perfectly possible for you to, to try to test that. Uh, and you could look at just excluding uh, incumbents from, from this analysis. And what you also brought up, I think it would be really interesting uh, to investigate how vo uh, voters are affected by, by this price shock. Because uh, uh, if they are an, an alternative interpretation, uh, might be that voters uh, benefit from the price shock if, if more public goods are, are provided by the mines or just uh, income opportunities from the mining industry. Uh, another uh, thing that I thought about is that uh, uh, you define this price shock in a very uh, uh, specific way uh, and uh, one potential concern might be that the way, the way you define this price shock uh, might be hinting at different mechanisms. So what I would like to see perhaps if, is if you could uh, find other ways of defining this as well and see whether results are robust to that. For example, there's this uh, uh, paper by Montero and Ferraz where they find different effects if you look at election year and not election year. And I think the way you define your price shock, you do not include prices during the election year. Uh, and another thing that, that would be great if you had a, a bit of a broader discussion on is uh, uh, what the, that, that the, the results seem to differ from, from the Brollo et al. findings uh, where they seem to, to emphasize uh, that the selection of candidates is, is, is the driving mechanism here. And then in terms of empirical specification, and I think mo most of these things are just the things that need to, to be clarified a bit in the paper. So sometimes you mentioned that you use state year fixed effects, and I think in the, in the tables it says constituency year fixed effects, and I think that is, uh, uh, that would just uh, exhaust all of your data if you had that, because I think that's the level of your observation. Uh, so just clarify that, and perhaps I think in order to, to control for time constant local differences, it might be worth just having state year fixed effects as well as constituency year fi uh, constituency fixed effects that are not at the constituency year level. Uh, another thing uh, where it also says two different things in the paper are whether you are clustering on the state or the state year level. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, state level uh, would, would be preferable here. And I think it would also be possible to try to deal with uh, autocorrelation within minerals as well. I know you, you say something about uh, that the way you define the shock will make this difficult, but there might be other ways to address this. For example, adjusting for spatial, uh, spatial correlation since a lot of these mines seems to be it seems to be uh, clustered around, uh, for example, the borders of the states. Uh, and then for the, for the, uh, for the candidate analysis, uh, I think you, you, could, you could include uh, candidate fixed effects. Uh, and I'm not sure whether you do that or not, but, uh, uh, but that would be, uh, really add to the credibility of that analysis, I think. And then that just some, some additional papers which are looking at, at similar topics, I think you would would benefit from, from discussing those in your paper and how, how your findings differ. Overall, I think they are very similar. They discuss something, for example, the, the paper by uh, Maldonado discussed the uh, uh, possibility of nonlinear effects, argues that that's really important. Uh, maybe that has some implications for you. Then there are just some things that I, uh, I would have liked you to, to just clarify a, a little bit concerning how uh, um, uh, mining regions aren't uh, benefiting from, from the actual uh, tax revenue from the mining industry, for example, and why you exclude coal from the analysis, uh, and then just clarify in the different tables what are the actual tables you use and how many elections are included in the different specifications. So that's, that's all I have. Okay, um, I guess I have the mic for now, so <laughs> I'll hand it over. Okay, no, this is really interesting paper I, I've read in, I, um, I find it really exciting. Um, I guess two 
two comments I had um, echo a little bit the discussion, so I don't want to repeat, only just to refine a little bit or to, to give a slight variation. So I do some work on the political process of spending, public spending, and you know we all know there's a lot of sausage making and so forth in public spending allocation. So um, even if there are no fixed formulas, I think there are ways you could, not perfect ways because there's resource, the, the deposits are static, so you can't really show in a very rigorous way perhaps that um, public expenditures are not going you know, uh, disproportionately to these areas, but you could try using some data to say, you know, if, if at least it supports your argument, you could see whether um, even the, the sausage making is not really influenced um, uh, such that resources, public resources go more to the deposit areas. Just on, that's just relating to your background um, identifying assumption. Um, then the I, a question on the price shock issue. So um, I'm not a macro person, so I, I, I don't think very clearly always in terms of how uh, global crisis would affect uh, uh, the value of minerals in, that are local. But, and, I do, and I guess you have a range of different uh, deposits and deposit types of different minerals, but what I'm just thinking is that you have variation in the quality of infrastructure, I would think, road infrastructure, other kind of infrastructure. And so the actual value um, that is relevant may, be, may differ in a systematic way possibly uh, mm -hmm. to the value based on essentially global prices. So I don't know if you wanna think a little bit more on that. Um, and then um, maybe the last point um, I had four, but one is really uh, very much similar to the discussion. The last point is more just m me loud thinking. It's about the issue of bad types or criminal types and non-criminal types. Um, I, you, right now you don't have a formal model yet, but even if it's very simple, I think it would be nice to just have some kind of model, very basic, but then also to reflect what you mean. Is it just pure type, sort of the nature of the person, you know, is it, that's I guess what you mean, but maybe you can relate it to relevant theoretical literature and types and politics, um, so. So I guess you don't consider the stick figures to be a model. <laughs> well, you have them in the paper, I read, but you're, they're not in the paper, so. <laughs> thanks, thanks Paul, really, really interesting paper. So um, I just wanted to, please, if you could clarify your, your uh, mineral data where it's from and um, their deposits, right? I guess that the, they're known deposits, so they, it might actually be time varying, but I suppose that for you it's in one period of time. So just if you could clarify that. Sure. Uh, why don't I take one more? Or was, was there one at the back? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, nice, interesting paper. Uh, my question's kind of on criminality and the time frame within which the crimes were committed, because I feel it's, it's a bit unfair to judge if it's like within office while they were, you know, or if it was like 18, 20 years ago when they were an 18 year old. So I feel like it's, it's unfair to judge the politician or incumbent based on crimes they committed when they were say 18 or whatever. That's it, yeah. Okay, so let me, let me go in reverse order. That's, a, that's an interesting point that no one has, has raised before. So I think that when, when you read about criminal politicians, it tends to be, I mean, this is, I don't have data to back this up, but people understand most of these things as criminal activities engaged in while being in office. Like it's often very, it's often very thuggish behavior, like having murder, you frequently see murder, uh, a lot of assault of public officials, a lot of rioting and this kind of stuff, which is kind of how a lot of politics is done in India. So this seems to be, very much about you know, how, how thuggish a particular politician is. Now, one thing that we wanna do, I think you had mentioned looking at different types of crimes, so that's definitely on the list. One, one flaw in the criminal data is that activists who engage in a lot of civil, civil disobedience accumulate a lot of uh, criminal cases against them as well. And this is also a type of person who you might see running for politics in mining areas. So we really wanna make sure we're separating thugs from activists. So I think that's something we can do. Unfortunately, we don't have the timing of the, the crimes that were allegedly committed, so that's, that won't be possible. But I, I'm not really worried that this is someone's, uh, you know, 17-year-old possession charge that's landing them in this database. Okay, source of mineral data. Uh, 
Indian Geological Survey maps from 2001 predating at least all of the criminal data. And unfortunately, we're still looking for mineral data that predates all the election results. We don't have that. So these are, you know, I think fairly high, sorry? There's no, time, there's no time variation. So the deposits are fixed at the beginning of the panel. And these deposits are, uh, the Geological Survey of India, I think, is plausibly unrelated to anything going on in the, in the mining industry. These are professional scientists. Do you want to say something, Sam? From talking to people, actually, uh, it seems like most of these deposits were discovered a long, long time ago because the Geological Survey of India hasn't, uh, doesn't seem to have done much in the last 30, 40 years. So we think, we've been told that these deposits actually predate our entire electoral series, but we don't have hard evidence on that. So one thing that we can do, which is done in the next paper, is that we can actually see whether these deposits are correlated with socioeconomic factors to see if they're, you know, if they, you're more likely to discover a deposit when you have a certain level of governance. Okay, I'm out of time, but let me talk briefly about price shocks because that came up a bunch. So obviously there are a bunch of different ways you can, you can measure price shocks. This, this main result that we're finding on criminality holds up no matter how you measure this. And our favorite specification is one that I didn't show you because we're just getting it together where you have a time series, you have state and district fixed effects. So you're really identifying on price shocks and they're about 10 constituencies per district. So you're really identifying off of price shocks in a really narrow area. And because we have this time period, we can look at changes in predicted output over time. And so we're defining the baseline period with exactly the same price shock as the later period. And, and little tweaks to how we define this in terms of election year or before election year, it doesn't seem to make, or it, it doesn't have any impact on this. This is very robust to how we specify price shocks. Obviously, there's a number of ways in which you could do it. And in the paper when we do this, we'll have to show that it can be done a number of ways. So I think that, I know there are other comments that I won't answer, but uh, we've written them down and they're helpful. So thank you everyone for your comments. So thank you very much. I'm happy to present my paper. I'm from University of Sussex. My name is Namara. So the title of my presentation will be Economic Consequences of Mineral Discovery and Extraction in Sub-Saharan Africa, where we're trying to investigate how mining affects local living standards measured by nightlights. Here we consider all mineral commodities in Africa, and we consider 42 Sub-Saharan African countries over the period of 1992 to 2012. Uh, before I start the detailed presentation, I would like to give you the preview of uh, our results. Uh, we are able to identify the causal effect of mineral discoveries and extraction uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Contrary to the conventional wisdom of the resource scarcity literature, we find that both mineral discovery and extraction improves local living standards or local uh, economic activities measured in nightlights. We do not find any evidence of resource cuts at the regional and cross-national uh, levels. And we also find that mine investments are not driven by the pre-existing levels of development measured by uh, nightlights and some infrastructure variables. And we also undertook some ba battery of robustness checks and our main results remain uh, robust. So as most of us are aware, uh, a large body of micro literature documented the negative relationship uh, between uh, growth rates of GDP per capita and uh, natural resource wells. Uh, uh, and most significant uh, energy went into documenting the adverse consequences of uh, mineral wells uh, or natural resource wells in resource-rich developing countries in general. 
and in sub-Saharan African countries in particular. Uh, one of the best examples that often grab uh, headlines in uh, popular media and uh, development literature is the ill management of oil wells in Nigeria and that of mineral wells in Democratic Republic of Congo. Despite all these uh, uh, efforts, establishing causality uh, uh, between uh, uh, natural resource wells and development has remained somewhat elusive. Uh, this is mainly due to the cross-national nature of the studies and perhaps uh, absence of credible exogenous variation in the data. In this paper, what we're trying to do is that we aim to explore the systematic uh, causal effect of mineral discovery and mineral extraction, where we're trying to consider that mineral discovery as exogenous shocks, and we instrument mineral production by international uh, commodity price. And one of the advantages we have here is that we have a geocoded data for discovery and production, which will uh, allow us to establish causal, uh, quasi natural experiment to establish causality. And also the good advantage we have here is that we use night lights, which would enable us to create uh, a uniform measure of uh, living standard or economic activity at uh, different uh, uh, spatial stratification at the district, region, and country uh, levels. Uh, this, give, uh, this figure is actually a replication from a paper by Henderson, Storygard, and Will, a paper on uh, night lights. It shows the story of uh, uh, change in economic activity before and after the discovery of gemstones in 1998 in an area uh, uh, called Ilakaka. It is uh, a district in Ihosi in, Ma in Madagascar. Uh, Ilakaka town did not exist before 1998. However, years after uh, the discovery of these uh, gemstones, Ilakaka has become one of the major trading centers for uh, gemstones, particularly the sapphire uh, commodity. The story of uh, this change in development can clearly be seen in the lights data. In, 18, uh, in 1998, we cannot clearly see, uh, there is no any pixel values that clearly shows uh, lights emanating to uh, the space. One year after the, the discovery, we can see clearly like you know, some few uh, lights. And few years after, especially like you know, five years uh, after the discovery, we see clearly uh, significant growth in the number of uh, pixel values from which lights are uh, uh, visible. And our units of observation is uh, second level subnational administrative classifications of the year 2000, which we refer them as uh, district. In total, we have uh, 3,635 districts, 519 regions, and 42 countries over the uh, 21 years in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, one of our main independent variables here is uh, the value of uh, mineral production, where we extract the, the historical levels of production, production startup year, and uh, the status of uh, mining from Inkera database. Our data set contains uh, 548 industrial size mines with unbalanced production data uh, from the year 1992 to 2012. And the second uh, main uh, variable of interest is here, uh, the, an indicator for mineral discovery. We exploit this uh, discovery data set uh, from uh, Minex Consulting Database. Uh, we only considered discoveries from 1992 to 2012, and in total we have 263 uh, mineral discoveries, which are categorized as giant and major deposits. Here they try to clarify the difference between giant and major deposits. They call a mineral deposit as a giant if it has the capacity to generate uh, at least 0 0.5 billion USA dollar of annual revenue for at least 20, 20 years or more and they classify mineral deposits as a major if it has the capacity to generate 50 million, uh, uh, 50 million USA dollar of annual revenue for not as long life as the giant reserve. And our main outcome variable is uh, night lights as a proxy measure of uh, local economic development. And they are available at a very uh, high spatial resolution which help us to calculate uh, economic activity at the very uh, local level. The informational value of uh, using lights as a proxy measure of economic activity 
has been tested and applied by different uh, empirical literatures, which were, uh, which were published in uh, uh, top journals. So it is uh, uh, plausible to use lights as a proxy measure of uh, economic activity of, or uh, living standards at the very local level. The measure comes on the scale from zero to 63 digital number. The higher value indicates the greater intensity of lights, which means greater uh, intensity of economic activity. And using this light data, we are able to create light density by adjusting the intensity of lights by the, the area of land, surf, uh, land surface area. And also as alternative uh, outcome variable, we try to calculate lights per capita, adjusting the light intensity by size of uh, population. Uh, one of the main key challenge in uh, uh, estimating the causal effect of mineral production on local development is the potential reverse causality. So in order to account for such potential issues, we uh, instrument mineral extraction by exogenous international commodity price. Uh, this IV estimation strategy would also help us to uh, mitigate potential attenuation bias, which could be stemming from uh, uh, standard measurement errors because we do not, uh, uh, we're not confident that we are covering all uh, mineral industries or all uh, uh, production data sets. And also, as you can see here, we have some couple of uh, uh, deter uh, determinants of local economic development, which we use them as, uh, pro uh, as control variables, such as population density and some geographical and climate variables. And we have also some political economy variables and some infrastructure variables. So in order to estimate the local effect of mineral production on development, we use this model. We are mainly interested in the change in mineral production, the effect of change in mineral production on light density, proxy measure of living standard. So we, uh, this gamma presents uh, mineral production elasticity of development. Development. If the conventional wisdom of the resource scarcity literature holds, we would expect gamma to be negative and uh, statistically uh, significant. And as I said earlier, we are going to instrument mineral production or mineral extraction by exogenous uh, 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 commodity price. And this is the result uh, we find. The first three columns present annual data. And in first column, we just did uh, an incomplete specification without uh, fixed effect. And we find that mineral production is observed to be positive and statistically significant. Column two presents uh, including year, fixed, uh, year and region fixed effect. And our coefficients as expected uh, declines. And we find higher uh, coefficient when we use IV estimation. Uh, this is perhaps could, uh, uh, IV estimation is correcting for uh, attenuation bias, as I said earlier. And column four and five, we try to use uh, decadal data frequency, and our coefficients remain positive and statistically significant. The main reason why we're using decadal data frequency is that some people may say that annual data are just uh, picking up transitory uh, uh, short-run fluctuations. So this decadal data frequency is suggestive of uh, uh, long-run uh, relationship. The other issue uh, with this type of data that from column one to five, we are just doing level effect, the level effect of mineral production on development. But people may argue that mineral production could have a dynamic effect on uh, development. So in this column six, we try to explore such possibility by changing our dependent variable to grows. And also with, uh, we include some uh, lagged lagged values of uh, 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 night lights on the right hand side and we use our Elano bond uh, dynamic JMM estimator and we find that gross elasticity of uh, mineral production is positive and statistically significant. So previously uh, just the table shows the effect of mineral production. How about the effect of uh, mineral uh, production start year? From this figure we see that the light uh, start improving just ar about two years before uh, 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 the actual start of mineral production. And we see that like, you know, steady or firm increase in lights over the long term period, even after uh, 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 10 years. The reason, uh, or, uh, the plausible argument we have here is that uh, most of the time before they start 
before the actual start of mineral production, mining uh, infrastructures moves closer to the mining investment because they have to build all these infrastructures. So that's why they need high employment and the different uh, uh, reasons. So that's the argument we have, the reason why uh, we see slight improvement in light density here. We also try to do some uh, comparison here. Uh, co okay. uh, we ha our treated district here is uh, the solid line. These are districts which started mineral production for the first time between 2003 and 2012. And we have two uh, control groups here. The first control groups is uh, uh, never mind district. There is no history of mineral production in this district. Uh, indicated by this uh, 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 line. We have also another uh, control group, which is prospective uh, mining district. There is a feasibility of uh, production, but they, they have not yet started producing, at least in 2012. So when we see pre-treatment, we do not see any divergent trend between the treatment and the control district. But after the treatment production, we see that uh, 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 mining district has better economic fortunes. So uh, the other part of our uh, uh, work is uh, the, to, see, to identify the effect of discovery shocks on local developments. Uh, the model is like uh, the variables are all identical with the previous equation, except we have here MD, which is an indicator for mineral discovery, and we have YD. Uh, YD is the number of years with discovery from T minus 10 to T minus one. This is capturing the intensity of discoveries in the past decade. Uh, 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 this would give us the advantage of uh, seeing the effect of discovery in the current year, conditioned on the intensity of past uh, discoveries. Uh, the main advantage or the main uh, selling point here while we're using uh, mineral discovery is that it has some interesting features here because what we're trying to use is the timing of discovery uh, should be considered as purely exogenous in a sense that no one has the capacity to predict the timing of the discovery, but someone can expect the location of the discovery based on uh, 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 historical uh, discoveries or uh, uh, the geology of uh, the area. And this is the result uh, we find by using uh, discovery shocks uh, as exogenous uh, shocks. So column one, two, three, uh, 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 we try to see the effect of discovery shocks in the same year, two years post-discovery and four years post-discovery. And we do not find any statistically significant effect. And in column four, five, and six, we try to see the effect after uh, six years eight years and 10 years, and uh, we find the positive effect after uh, uh, six years and onwards. This is suggestive that we are picking up a long run uh, relationship. We try to also check, uh, even though we use like, you know, this exogenous variation uh, data, we try to check in our data if we have the case of uh, uh, reverse causality, and we do not find any systematic uh, relationship between pre-existing levels of development and future mining investment. We also try to check general equilibrium effect by uh, extending our uh, uh, units of observation from district to uh, regional and country levels. And we do not find any evidence for a negative relationship. At the regional level, we find some positive effect, but at the country level, we do not find uh, any uh, uh, negative effect. I think I'm running out of time. and. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, no, what have I done? <laughs> All right, uh, oh, that's really too bad. I, does somebody know how I can unlock this computer? I had such a nice visual demonstration that I was going to show you. Oh, well, um, I'll go without it. I really, really like this paper. Uh, they do a really nice, OK, so the, the, the basic idea is we want to proxy economic growth using nightlights, and we want to see 
whether um, more minds lead to more light. So I think this was done very convincingly, lots of robustness checks. I really like the stuff on the timing of production. It shows that lights seem to pick up four or five years after discovery, one or two years before production begins, right in line with how we think these minds operate. So uh, I've torpedoed the next person's presentation too. <laughs> very sorry. Um, yeah, so I think, I think this part is done really well. What you really need to watch out for, and there's a, everyone's always a little worried with nightlights and wondering exactly what they predict. I think in this presentation, it's particularly uh, risky in that minds generate light. Minds generate a lot of light. And so what you're picking up, and particularly in that initial graph where you gave us, where the blob, the new blob appeared right where the mine was, you can look at these on the satellite images, and these are mining camps. There's often a factory there. They're often running all night long. And for the number of people who are around one of these places, it's generating far more light than you know, a population center producing. You know, a population center with that same number of people would not generate near as much light. So what you've, what you've shown very clearly is that there's lots of local economic activity right around the mine. I think fundamentally the resource curse question is not, is there lots of local economic activity around a mine? Because we know there has to be lots of local economic activity around a mine. If you're extracting resources around the mine, then there's stuff going on. What we really want to know is what's this doing to development at the broader level? And so I thought it was particularly interesting on the first image that you showed us where the mine was getting brighter, but then the secondary town was actually getting less bright. And that actually sounds exactly like what we're worried about, that overall development is not doing as well as it would be in the absence of a mine. So this is going to be challenging to, this is going to be challenging to find with only nightlight data. So I have, I have two suggestions for um, what you can do. One is any kind of local spatial data that you can get, even on population density, would go a long way towards showing that you're finding something other than just light. And two, it seems like your mines are geolocated and your night lights are geolocated. So I'm not sure why you're using these 4,000 districts. You can have much more precise data covering all of Africa. And then you can do something like, let's take all the other towns in the district where a mine is. And let's see what happens to overall development in the, we can subtract the mine, we're going to take the lights, the, the places that were lit up before the mine existed, and then we're just going to look at growth in those places. And then you're really seeing who's growing independent of the, of the mine. The issue with your, with your region and your country results is those, you're finding broader effects, but you have to subtract the mine. Otherwise, you may just be finding the same effect in the regional results as you're finding in the mine level results. Uh, so I think that's all I had. But I thought, I thought it was a great, I, th I think it's a great start. I think you have a little way a little way to go to, um, to convince us that this is actually good for development and not just uh, observing light from these mining areas. Uh, should I take? OK, thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm Anya Tolnan. So um, a co-author of mine and I uh, did this paper, African Mining, Gender and Local Employment, with Oxcar uh, 2013. We used the same data as you, so the raw minerals data. Now, um, in that paper, we found that across the African continent, uh, we saw labor market effects of these mines opening, decrease in agriculture, more service sector, most, more uh, mining, and more manual labor employment. Do you think that's the mechanism that you're seeing here, those labor market effects? So that's my first question. Um, additionally, in that paper we had, um, so we're using the same data, so maybe in a shorter, in a longer time period, um, I know you said you had 530 mines that you were using from Intera RMG. Um, we had many more than that, so I'm wondering if you have um, selected your sample in that case, how you've selected it. Um, Lastly, I think my um, short point on nightlights, um, when these mines open in rural Africa, they might, they might open in areas that have no electricity prior. 
And many mines, depending on the industry, are open pit mining, so they'll emit a lot of light themselves. So the, the economic spillovers could potentially be zero. Now, I mean, my research, I think, says that it isn't. But then, um, if you have a way of dealing with that, that would be great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Anne. Okay, thank you very much for uh, your comments. Yeah, I think the first point I want to address is about this. What about if these lights are coming from the, this industry themselves? What we try to do is, one thing I want to make sure that like, what we are picking here is long run effect, not short run fluctuations. Because sometimes you do find that these big industries are, yes, working over time uh, by like, you know, they may work at night and have these big uh, lights. Uh, we could not find any mechanism how to check this, but what we try to see is like, uh, we try to read some histories of the industries and most of the industries are, they do not work at night. And the satellites are really picking like, you know, these lights at very, you know, late in the evening. Uh, so, uh, that is what, uh, and also the one thing we wanted to do in this paper is that we would like to check with the demand or the electricity at the household level and see if households are, uh, uh, have higher uh, electricity uh, access. Uh, the other thing is, yes, we are planning to do a spatial spillover. To extend, because what we have done here is like, you know, we try to extend it at the region and cross country level. We could not, f yes, we could not find any negative uh, relationship. But what we are planning to do is to do a proper spatial spillovers by properly identifying, like, you know, the true comparison groups for with which uh, districts are we really comparing the e effects of uh, the industry. So that's, yeah, our main plan to extend our work. And the other question is about the 548 industrial mines. Uh, we are considering in 18 mineral commodities for which we have uh, international uh, commodity prices. So that could explain why we left out some of uh, industries which are really producing only one single commodity, in which case we don't have the price, so they might come out. And also one of the point is you, you considered in your analysis from uh, 1980s, if I'm not mistaken, but we are considering here from 1992. So that could also explain a little bit of a reduction in the sample size. We did not do any systematic uh, selection into these industries. Yeah, the other thing is like, I don't know how we could check if this effect is about labor effect. But what I can say is that the figure I showed you earlier about the Ilakaka town, yes, we clearly see that people are moving from uh, the main city to that area, but we don't have any data to check if this migration is uh, uh, from other districts. What we can clearly see, uh, try to see is within the districts, yes, clearly we can see, uh, how to say, reallocation of uh, people. So it could uh, pick up that and also there could be some uh, uh, prob uh, advantage of this uh, demand shock of on agriculture, not in terms of employment, but demand for uh, goods uh, produced uh, locally. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so it's working, yeah. Okay, good afternoon. Um, thank you all for coming on um, this sunny afternoon um, after a long conference. Um, so uh, my name is Mele Kreiber, I'm at the University of Göttingen, and um, yeah, I would like to present to you joint work with um, Axel Dreher from Heidelberg. Um, it's a paper where we try to link 
Webby Link, um, fossil fuels with violent behavior of political groups. So the motivation behind this is basically that there's a pretty broad literature um, in, that was more or less started here in Oxford, I guess, um, on the resource curse in civil war. So there's been this big greed versus grievances discussion um, where I assume that most people have at least, at least heard of it. Um, and so nowadays there is maybe not consensus, but very close to consensus that it's often rather greed um, that drives group into violent behavior um, yeah, rather than grievances. All these analyses, however, um, were taken or were, were yeah, carried out at the country level. Um, there's a very recent um, exception by Hunsig and Sederman from Zurich um, who look at ethnic groups and who find that actually grievances also play a role because they find that only groups in areas um, with oil kind of rebel um, if they do not have any access to political power. So if they don't have a say in, for example, how revenues are allocated. Um, to the best of our knowledge, there's no serious attempt, at least, to test the resource curse with respect to terrorism, although there are many different ways how you could hypothesize that grievances or greed might also play a role um, in terror, and that, well, these should also be linked um, to, to oil in our case. Um, there are very few studies that include oil or uh, mineral resources as a control variable um, when analyzing terrorism, but none of these really find a consistent relationship. So our research question then is, what determines if an ethno-political group um, yeah, fights for their views <laughs> peacefully, takes up terrorist activities, or even starts an insurgency? So what we do is we look at geocoded fossil fuel resources and political groups over time, thus taking the whole analysis at the sub-national level, um, looking at groups, as I said, and making use of a panel data set. So all of these things are yeah, rather new, so that would be our main contribution to the literature. Um, and the theoretical idea underlying our empirical ana analysis is basically that political groups are rational actors who decide on the strategy they take by weighting risks and potential benefits, specifically by looking at their own strength, their own size, or other characteristics, and of course also at the state they act in and the relative strength they have. So the hypothesis then is that oil should per se play a role, um, both with regard to terrorism or insurgency, but that this role might differ, for example, when it comes to political discrimination or power sharing, as in the paper that I just <coughs> quoted. Um, also, possibly when it comes to regional autonomy, because you can assume that, well, the higher the degree of autonomy, the higher also the degree of control over potential revenues. Um, economic discrimination, because yeah, inequality has often found to play a role, and now we're taking this to the group level and also whether or not a group is supported by a foreign state, because this should increase the strength or possibly self-confidence of that group. So the data we used, and that uh, possibly also explains why I keep on saying oil rather than natural resources per se, is we look at a data set that is focused on the MENA region, so Middle East and North Africa, and it includes 118 ethno-political organizations and covers um, the period from 1980 to 2004. So um, this data set has a couple of strengths, specifically obviously because it looks at groups rather than countries, and also because it includes peaceful and violent groups. So usually when looking at groups, you only have those in your data set that have already turned violent, thus you kind of lack a pretty important counterfactual, the groups that never actually became violent. Um, the main shortcoming, obviously, is the geographical coverage. So it's just the MENA region. It's only 13 countries. Um, I would be so rash to say that I think the external validity is slightly higher still when looking at groups rather than countries, but I assume that uh, this might be debatable. What we do is we implement a multi-level random intercept model, which ends up looking just like a multinomial logic model. Um, but has the huge advantage 
that we can actually, as I said, um, use the panel structure of our data so we can follow the same group over time rather than having to depend on fixed effects or something like that, which is tricky in nonlinear models. So our outcome variable is the weapon of choice, um, which takes three forms. So it can either be, a group can either be peaceful, um, take up terrorist activities, or start an insurgency. And then we regress this on our indicator of fossil fuels, which I will come to in a minute. Um, as I said, we will interact this indicator with a few other variables. And of course, we have a bunch of controls at the group and country level. Um, so this type of modeling has the advantage that we include all three strategies in one model and we can test them against each other. Um, we do consider terrorist and activities and insurgencies as distinct choices here. So it's not considered to be somehow a dynamic process from peace to terrorism to insurgency. Um, but even if this was the case in reality, it would still be interesting to see um, how they differ, I think. Um, yeah. and of course, the model accounts for the fact that the decision of an organization in one year is very likely to be dependent on the decision of the same organization in the previous year. So we take this clustering over time into account. Just to go over this quite briefly, but um, so we have these two forms of violence that we have to take or to, to define and, and take apart a little bit here. So it's a mixture of basically action and actor-based characteristics that we use. Um, and so we follow this very narrow definition of terrorism. And of course, defining terrorism, I know, is always tricky. There are like hundreds of different definitions out there. Um, this is a very, as I said, very narrow one um, that is, however, followed in much of the literature. So basically, when a group mainly attacks civilians rather than, for example, soldiers, um, it's a terrorist organization. Whereas large-scale violent events of insurgencies or civil wars, however I might call them, um, are cases where it's really violence as a regular strategy of the group. Um, they do target uh, yeah, security personnel. Uh, it takes more the form of a rebellion, guerrilla, civil war, things like that. And specifically, if a group holds control of a territory, you would say that requires quite a lot of organization, quite a lot of structure within the group, so it's not really a terrorist organization anymore. And the other main variable of interest, so we have geocoded data on regional oil production, and we follow the Cedermann and Hunziger paper that I mentioned earlier. In, um, have, well, we, we know um, the distribution of oil reserves across the country, and we also um, know the value of national oil production and what the assumption then is, is that, for example, if the Kurdish region in Iraq holds 30% of the oil reserves of the whole country, it will also have 30% of the national oil revenues in a given year. And this has the huge advantage that it obviously varies over time and is at the subnational level. However, you could quite convincingly, I guess, argue that there might be reverse causality, for example, in years with conflict, um, oil production might go down as well. So as a robustness check, um, we use a simple dummy for oil fields. So the pure existence of minerals should plausibly um, be exogenous to violent behavior, um, and we can more or less replicate our results with that. As I said, we have a bunch of group, ethnicity, and country-level control variables. Um, just for the control variables, I mean, these are all more or less the standard variables from the literature. Um, we do include them because they should be in there, but we don't put too much weight on the interpretation because, as I said, we only have 13 countries in the sample. There's not really a sample size where you want to yeah, be too convinced on your, about your findings. So this is the first table. Um, all the control variables are just listed up and are included. I just drop them so you have a chance to be able to read the numbers. Um, as I said, it's a multinomial logit model, so always two columns belong together. Um, the coefficients or the numbers you see are odds ratios. So um, a number larger than one indicates there's a positive relationship. A number smaller than one indicates there's a negative relationship. 
and the relationship is always relative to the base category, which is peace, or peaceful behavior, rather. Um, as you can see quite quickly, um, so we have this rather robust positive effect of oil reserve, or rather oil production, in the region where an ethnic group resides um, on the probability that a political group will take up arms for insurgency. Um, whereas we do not find any relationship between uh, fossil fuels and terrorism. And um, one thing that you cannot see, but that we tested is um, this odds ratio is also significantly larger than this one. So insurgencies are more likely than peaceful behavior, but also than terrorist activities. Coming to the first interaction term that I told you about, so that's columns three and four, where we look at political discrimination. Um, there's no significance there, so the interaction term doesn't, or there's, this doesn't seem to be a meaningful of dif way of differentiating the effect of oil on strategic behavior. Um, interestingly, the political discrimi discrimination per se does have a rather big effect on terrorism. So if a group is politically discriminated against, and this makes um, it, it more likely by a factor of 1.8 that this group will take up terrorist activities. Um, this is in line with, for example, what Ross or Sambanis argued, that terrorism often is more a political or has more political reasons, whereas insurgencies often always yeah, can be traced back to economic motivations. Um, in columns five and six, we can replicate what Sedeman and Hunziger found. So here also in this sample, um, if a group has access to local power, so if it participates in power sharing, um, this does make it less likely for this group, yeah, again, to take up arms. <laughs> Second table. So here, in columns one and two, um, I find this actually quite interesting, um, and I'm curious to hear if you uh, find my explanation for this uh, convincing. So we still have this uh, very robust um, relationship between oil in a group's territory and insurgency. And when it comes to autonomy, actually the effect is opposite to power sharing. Um, and also based on, again, Ross or Sambanis and quite some other literature, I would interpret this in a way that if a group already has autonomy, this shows it has a certain ambition for independence. And of course, if you then have oil on your territory, that's a pretty good basis to start a state and to possibly fight for independence, actually. So I would, that, that's where I would um, interpret that this positive relationship comes from. Whereas terrorism um, in the case becomes less likely in the case of more autonomy. Again, I think that this shows that um, political factors seem to be more important for terrorism, whereas economic factors seem to be playing the yeah, more important role for insurgency. Um, yeah, economic discrimination is very similar or equivalent to political discrimination. And lastly, in columns five and six, as I said, we assume that if a group is supported by a foreign state, this should make the group stronger um, relative to the own state and indeed, this is important for both forms of violence as such. So both forms of violence um, become more likely if the group is supported by a foreign state, um, while the odds ratio for insurgency is significantly larger than the one for terrorism. Um, again, I personally find the interaction terms quite interesting because as soon as we include the interaction, this doesn't make any difference for terrorism. So apparently there, the foreign state support um, or the effect of oil, somehow they're independent of each other. Whereas here, the significance of the parent term somehow disappears. Um, so the foreign state support seems to be running a bit through these oil reserves. And again, um, I would argue that here, well, also for the foreign state, if there's oil in the region, um, it increases the stakes um, and possibly the attractiveness of sparking a bit of a secessionist war or something. So to conclude, um, organizations are more likely to rebel in 
regions, I should probably rather say, that are rich in oil. So we do not find any evidence for the resource curse to extend to terrorism. And in general, to come back to this uh, yeah, established vocabulary, so in insurgencies, greed indeed seems to be um, more important than grievances. Um, <laughs> regional distribution actually seems to matter. So this is something that we lose when just looking at the country level, um, especially if it's concentrated in an area um, that already drives for more autonomy or independence or that gets more support by foreign states. This is likely to yeah, spark insurgency. Um, while I wouldn't be too pessimistic, um, I think this power sharing result um, as a policy implication yeah, seems to show that giving people a bit more say in um, yeah, the allocation of revenues seems to make them more peaceful. Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to your comments. So, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's really very good work, even though I personally believe that uh, natural resource leads to peaceful political environment because of income and all this uh, employment opportunity. Despite all this, uh, my personal belief, I have some uh, few uh, comments here. It is really quite interesting, the fact that you have raised about uh, terrorism, but the issue I have here is what is the standard definition of uh, terrorism? Because uh, there are many issues about like, you know, uh, it is quite difficult to distinguish between like, you know, violence against civilians and repression by government on civilians and also on political organizations. I don't, uh, how to identify all these things, especially in this area of like you know, North Africa and the, uh, the Middle East uh, countries. And also I believe that if you are really capturing about violence against uh, these civilians or repression by government against civilians and uh, other political organizations, it would be better to use terms like uh, uh, violence against civilians or repression, which is like you know, a common term in this political and economic literature in natural uh, resource. The other point is about justification for greed and grievance hypothesis. Many people uh, tend to justify or theoretically convince people about these uh, theories, but the issue is can we test them within our data? If so, they would be uh, very good. Uh, the other uh, issue I have is you have clearly mentioned it in your paper. Uh, you say that the actions of an organization claiming, claiming to act on behalf of an ethnic group may not actually representative of that group. At the same time, investigating ethnic groups in their entirety may hide important differences among the various organizations representing each group. I want to see what is like, you know, the choice at the ethnic group level. Because if you consider these different organizations, let's say for, we have in, in one particular area, we have a natural resource. We are going to associate one single natural resource to different political organizations with different choices, which is going to predict us like, you know, it can predict terrorism, it can also predict peace, it can also predict insurgency. So is it possible to have a representative choice at a ethnic group level? Uh, that is uh, the comment. The other uh, comment, uh, or as a question, but yeah, it's a comment. Maybe to consider to include military expenditure. Recently, this military expenditure is coming up as a, a mitigation strategy of uh, insurgencies, mainly in developing countries. The higher the military expenditure, which is flown from the natural resources, tend to reduce the likelihood of uh, insurgency. So. I feel like it, it would be good to consider or categorize countries by their level of uh, military uh, uh, expenditure. The other uh, comment I have is about you on your uh, econometrics. You considered one year like lengths. Uh, would it be possible also to try like, the robustness of your result to increase two, three, four years uh, lag? Because I know the, you are using production, but most of the time you cannot really see like, you know, adjustment within one year especially in terms of political campaigning to organize your population to, 
stand up with you and <laughs> go to the jungle to fight. It takes time, so yeah, it's good to see how uh, 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 the changes of production uh, plays a uh, few years before they take this uh, decision. The other thing is you, uh, your standard years are clustered at ethnic group level. Uh, no, you cluster them at organizations level. I feel like it would be better to cluster them at ethnic group level to allow a little bit, if you stick to your uh, way of uh, identification, to allow a little bit of uh, correlations within the ethnic group, but not independent across ethnic groups. And also I feel like, and sometimes you can consider two way of uh, clustering uh, at ethnic and also country level so that we can uh, count. You can refer Michalopoulos and Papanua how they did this two way of clustering at ethnic level and uh, country level. This is my comment. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, very useful comments. Uh, yeah, the definition of terrorism. I mean, that's, that's what I already said during my presentation. That's, of course, always a point where you can discuss forever. Um, this is a definition that is definitely used by, for example, the Global Terrorism Database, which I think is a pretty widely used um, database in the analysis of, of terrorist activities. Um, the, the reason why we also opted for this very narrow definition is we have somehow have to keep our types of violence apart in this model. So we have to be able to code a group, whether a group is now carrying out the terror, well, no? the, the more smaller scale, activity or more the larger scale activity and there it also helps to have a more narrow definition so so, so the I mean it's already very difficult to take the, the dimensions apart but if they kind of blur into each other it gets gets even more difficult um, yeah all the other things I, I definitely are good ideas I basically have to try them I mean I did cluster at the country level I think it's somewhere in the appendix and um, that didn't change anything the ethnic group I have to think about because, of course, in this region you have the same ethnic groups um, in different countries, right? So Kurds, you have them all over the place, Shiites, you have Sunnis, you have them uh, in many different countries. So, um, but I will, I will definitely think about uh, how to implement that. Yeah. Any further questions or comments? Hi, just a small clarification. The last uh, table you saw, the this one? Yeah, just the rightmost bottom, the standard error is 0 0.225 and coefficient is 1.67. Still, you don't get significance there. Um, so no, no, these are p-values. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, a uh, good point. I should have, it, it, it should be, I, I cut the notes out for, for the tables to be as large as possible, but it's, it's p-values. You're, you're right, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, great. Good to see that you all seem to be still awake, despite it's the last presentation. So this is uh, joint work uh, with uh, Anja here and uh, Juna Thorsen at Uppsala, Uppsala University. Uh, the purpose of, of this work is essentially to investigate the effect of uh, mining activity on criminality. So as we have uh, seen, uh, just from the discussion we've had earlier here today and in many of the other uh, sessions in this conference as well, uh, mineral resources could potentially play a, an important uh, role for development. Uh, they are dominant in a large number of countries. For example, according to the World Bank, in 81 countries, uh, mineral resources play an important role. Collect and these uh, countries collectively account for a quarter of world's GDP, half of the world's population and nearly 70% of those in extreme poverty. The mining industry, if we focus on that one, uh, is an important uh, global employer, employing about 1% of the global workforce. 
and some recent paper, I'm just uh, quote, uh, quoting a few here, uh, have found that uh, they, m the mining industry might have local labor market uh, effects. However, at the same time as there are these potential benefits uh, of uh, uh, the mineral industry, there's also this very large literature that link uh, extractive industries in, in general to violence and conflict. And very recently, there have uh, been a number of papers focusing explicitly on the mining industry and also seeing that mining tend to lead to increased uh, violence and conflict. Much of this literature, however, has focused on uh, conflict as the outcome and in settings uh, in low-income countries. So we know relatively little about uh, the link between these extractive industries and violent crime in a middle-income setting. So that's essentially the broad aim of this, of this research that we want to investigate whether we still need to worry about potential detrimental effects on criminal activity from this industry in this other type of setting. So just to, to further motivate this a bit, this map here is showing you the homicide rates by country uh, for the latest available year. Uh, what stands out here is that we see that many of the countries that have high uh, rates of violence also have uh, um, uh, large mineral deposits. So for example, we see this for, for a large number of countries in Africa, but also in Central and Latin America. And one of the, the countries that really stand out here on, on, on the map is South Africa, which you see has among one of the highest homicide rates in the world. And that's also the country that we focus on in this paper. So the more specific question that we're asking is, what is the impact of mining activity on the South African local crime rate? And in order to try to answer this question, we'd use both time and geographic variation in mining activity from 2003 until 2012. In order to identify the causal effect, we exploit fluctuation in international mineral prices. And we look at very local levels of criminal activity, uh, both uh, violent and property crime. And in the last part of the paper, we try to investigate uh, the potential mechanisms that could, could explain the results we find. So just to, to, to get us thinking about this, we, we uh, see essentially two main competing mechanisms for how mining activity uh, could, could affect criminal activity. So just following uh, what we've seen a lot on, uh, in this conference and, and some of the work I, I cited earlier, uh, mining activity might affect local labor market, either through direct employment effects or through indirect spillovers to the rest of the economy. And just following the, the sim, uh, simple Becker framework, uh, this might alter the opportunity costs of engaging in criminal activity. So this would then lead the mining industry to reduce crime levels. At the same time, there's this uh, potential uh, grabbing, uh, grabbing effect where uh, the mine essentially increases uh, in incentives uh, of predatory behavior because there's uh, uh, a spike in, in the amount of resources available to steal. This might be directly from the mine or just uh, from, from the economy as a whole. And this is the mechanism that has been mostly emphasized in, in the literature focusing on mining and, and conflict. So essentially, uh, in the end, uh, the effect of mining activity on conflict depends on uh, which of these effects that we believe dominate. And this might be related to the relative factor intensities of the particular industry that experienced a shock, as outlined in the theory by Dalbo and Dalbo, and which has also been shown in empirical work by, by Dubin and Weigas. So just a preview of, of, of the findings. Uh, what we find in this paper is that mining activity uh, leads to lower levels of crime, uh, results largely hold for both property and violent crime, However, uh, what we see when we get into the specific timing, we see that a negative production shocks that occur when mines uh, shut down lead to increases in criminal activity. Uh, we suggest that, that the explanation for these findings are that income opportunities by the mine are important. And we, we try to, to validate, validate this by using uh, light at night data, as well as a sub-analysis where we split the sample into labor-intensive and capital-intensive mines. So just to give you a bit of background on, on mining and crime in South Africa before we move on, uh, violent crime is, is, a, is a really serious problem in South Africa. 
the World Competitiveness Survey, for example, ranks South Africa worst out of 133 countries. There's a lot of violent uh, crime every day. 50 murders are reported, 100 rapes, and 330 armed robberies. At the same time, South Africa uh, has the fifth largest mining industry in the world, contributing uh, both directly and indirectly substantially to GDP. And the industry employs about half a million people. There's also been recent uh, media attention towards this link between uh, the mining industry and crime. For example, the Marikana Platinum Mine clashes, which led to the death of 34 mine workers. Some uh, uh, historical evidence also point to, or at least people have claimed, that uh, the mining industry in South Africa are one of the contributors to the high uh, crime rate, which further motivates uh, studying this question. So then moving on to the data, we use information about all large-scale mining operations in South Africa, which we have information about from 75 until today. Uh, we know the minerals produced and the exact geographic location uh, of a mine. In total, there are 320 mines in South Africa that we investigate that uh, produce 23 different minerals. And in order to deal with uh, different reporting standards, both between companies and different minerals, we code mining activity as a dummy uh, for each uh, mineral mine combination. And then what uh, emerges from, from this data is essentially that there are very large fluctuations in mining production during our sample period from 2003 until today, which means that the industry is essentially both expanding and contracting at the same time, which is good for us because it gives a bit of credibility to, to our analysis that we are not just following a general trend here, but there, there's substantial uh, variation between minerals. For example, gold, copper, and silver increased uh, or decreased sorry, during our per period, whereas iron ore and cobalt uh, uh, increased. And South Africa is also an important uh, producer globally of some of these uh, minerals, and uh, I'll discuss a bit later in, in how we try to address that. Then moving on to the crime data, we've got uh, crimes reported from, from all police stations in South Africa. Uh, these are reported for each financial year from 2003 and uh, are uh, reported at a very detailed level for 20, 29 different categories. We aggregate these categories to property, uh, violent and total crime rates uh, at these local levels. Then the way we construct our sample is essentially uh, that we match all mines to the precincts that lie within 20 kilometers of the mine in order to allow, allow for, for potential spillover from the mine. So for example, we see the mine in the middle here is uh, matched to, to three uh, police precincts, whereas the one on the left here is only matched to that particular uh, police precinct where it's located. So then, just to give you a glimpse of the data, uh, we see that if we aggregate great old mining activity, there's an increase during our sample period from relatively low levels in the beginning to, to a sharp increase from, from 2006 and onwards. Uh, looking at criminal levels, we see, see an opposite pattern. Uh, the overall trend in South Africa is that criminal levels decrease. However, uh, what's interesting to note here is that in, in the later periods here when, when mining activity increase, uh, um, the, uh, the crime levels in the mining areas, which is the solid line here, attempt to decrease even more. And this uh, is essentially true for all of these uh, categories here. Then moving on to the empirical strategy, we use uh, two different strategies in this paper, both uh, a fixed effect approach as well as an IV strategy. And in the presentation here, I'll, I'll focus just on, on the IV. And the uh, uh, reasoning behind the strategy is essentially that there's vast anecdotal evidence that production decisions uh, depend on international prices and the profitability of engaging in, in uh, uh, mining activity. So uh, the, the evidence for the credibility of this strategy is essentially that uh, demand elasticities are typically low since minerals are a small share of production costs and thus uh, uh, price should be driven by demand rather than changes in supply. And this uh, strategy of, of instrumenting mining activity with international mineral prices ha has been used in, in, in similar ways by, by some recent papers. So th this is essentially uh, the way we define our 
first stage where we instrument a number of mineral eye mines that are located in, in Precinct J in year T with the International Mineral Prize uh, of the, uh, the mineral produced in that mine. And then in the second stage, we investigate the effect on, on the log crime rate in that uh, specific police precinct. We control for mineral by precinct fixed effects as well as uh, time fixed effects. And just to show you, there's substantial uh, variation in, in mineral prices here. Uh, there, uh, there's a, a general trend for some of the minerals of an increase during the period, but, but th th there's considerable variation. Then uh, moving on to, to our main results, uh, this is uh, first showing you the, the first stage here, which uh, the interpretation of this is essentially that uh, one standard uh, deviation uh, increase in the mineral price uh, increases uh, the mean number of active mines by about 18%. And then uh, what's interesting to take away here is that we see this clear negative effect on all the different uh, crime categories of increases in mining activity. Uh, and this then uh, uh, corresponds to an effect of about 7% uh, for the total crime rate, somewhat higher for property crime and somewhat lower for violent crime. Then, in order to try to delve a bit more into the dynamics here, why do we uh, find these negative effects? We try to uh, investigate separately the effect on uh, starts in production as well as stops in mining production. Uh, we do this based on the fact that there's a lot of variability during the period and mines tend to both uh, start up and, and shut down production uh, frequently. So then first, uh, looking at starts in production, if we include our full sample, we essentially see that first stage does not predict uh, startups uh, of mining activity, uh, which we think is not too surprising since starting up uh, a new mine, for example, which is included in our sample here, uh, in involves a lot of uh, investment cost, and, uh, which might not uh, react to, to the international mineral price in such a, a short time span as we are considering here. However, uh, in the second part of the analysis here, uh, we focus on uh, only, uh, we exclude all the new mines, so that is essentially just uh, exploiting variation uh, in uh, production for those mines that already uh, are in place, so to speak. And then we find uh, relatively weak effects here, but at least uh, they go in, in, in the direction here but that we would expect that uh, crime levels tend to uh, decrease when mining activity, when a mine starts up. Instead, looking at stops in production, we find the opposite effect. Uh, first, in the first stage, as expected, higher mineral price uh, leads to fewer stops in production and these stops in production in turn le leads to substantial uh, increases in uh, uh, criminal activity. Then why do we find these uh, effects? Uh, results are, are pretty much in line with prediction from economic theory. If the opportunity, ca uh, if the opportunity cost channel dominates the grabbing ch uh, channel, uh, so then we want to uh, dig a bit deeper into this and see whether uh, this is actually seems to be the driving mechanism or not. What one uh, a problem with this is that uh, it's hard to find good labor market data at this very detailed level in South Africa where we want to do this. However, we propose two solutions to this. First, we uh, follow much of the literature that uses satellite data on lights at night to predict uh, economic activity. And then we investigate uh, effects separately in capital and labor intensive mines. First, uh, to, to the first uh, of this analysis, uh, we see that mining activity tend to increase uh, lights at night, as expected. Starts in production are associated with higher uh, lights at night, whereas stops in producing uh, reduces the amount of light density, indicating then that uh, mining activity does affect uh, crime levels. Then just finally, before I close up here, because I think I'm running out of time, uh, we see that effects are entirely driven by the labor-intensive mines, and we find uh, insignificant and uh, effects in the opposite direction even for those uh, capital-intensive mines uh, where we don't expect the uh, labor opportunity channel to be at work to the same extent. 
So we do a bunch of robustness uh, checks. Uh, our, all our results are supported by a fixed effect strategy. We use log of prices as an IV and count data as outcome. We do a randomization test to rule out that uh, results are driven by mineral trends. Uh, exclude those minerals for which South Africa is a main producer. Try to look at police expenditure. And then just to sum, sum up, I think I've said most of this, uh, just uh, results stand out compared to the previous literature that have found that increases in mining activity increase conflict and violence. Uh, the mining in industry might create conditions where crimes occur if an income shock hits. And this might be an important insight for policy given that uh, we have very high volatility in the mining industry. That's all. Um, yeah, so I haven't prepared any slides, so I'll just leave yours up. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, thanks very much. I really enjoyed reading this paper, and um, to me it felt like a rather polished paper, so I had the impression that you've already put a lot of uh, thought and a lot of work in this. Um, so, um, yeah, let's see what you, what you think about my comments. I actually had quite some trouble coming up with any. Um, so I've got two bigger um, comments and then a few smaller ones. The first one regards your instrument, and this is um, more an intuitive feeling, so maybe you can just think if, if it makes sense. So um, I was a bit surprised that you use the same instrument for number, starts, and stops of mines, and that you actually find significant first stages for all of these. Because looking at the exclusion restrictions, say starting with numbers of mines, shouldn't the price only have an effect on crime through the number of mines that you have, and not through any other channel, whereas then you go on showing that it actually also has an effect through mines starting or mines stopping, whereas the level could be completely constant when 10 mines open up and 10 year mines close down. Do you understand what I mean? So my impression is that you kind of violate your own exclusion restriction by using the same instrument for all these different um, yeah, indicators. I'm not, it's, it's more an impression, like a, a gut feeling, but maybe you can think about it. Um, and maybe a solution to this would be to just, as you call this shock, maybe you can just use a change in price or something. Um, instead of the price itself. Um, the second thing is, I don't really know a lot about mining in South Africa, but one thing that keeps on popping up in media reports and that you don't mention at all are illegal mines. So I was wondering, are illegal mines part of your criminality um, variable or um, how, how would they affect your results? Because I could assume, for example, you close down a mine, then maybe the illegal miners go back in or, or something like this. At least I think it would be interesting to discuss this. And in general, this is already going to the minor points, I wasn't actually 100% sure how you construct your crime variable and why you use logs. Um, so, so I, I mean, that's, that's easy, that wasn't just very clear to me. Um, in general, as you have done so many robustness checks, I was a bit overwhelmed by the amount of tables that you have. So I was wondering if maybe some of them could be left out or, I mean, doing it like here, just showing the IV or, or just showing the fixed effects regressions, maybe not, not showing both for all the specifications. I'm not sure how, how you feel what is really important and what, what you want to stress. Um, one thing, yeah, another thing is that was also mentioned in the, um, by the other gentleman is this, but that's only like a side regression for you. The, the impact of mining on light to me at least intuitively seemed very large. So one more mine increased, you didn't present this, but increases the lights in the region by 5%. To me this seemed very large and I actually had the same question that was brought up here. If the mines, I mean they themselves generate light, then I dropped the point because you said you, you mainly, it mainly runs through underground mines and I thought mm, surely underground mines they don't have as much light, but I don't know, that's just a, a guess. Um, and two really very small things. The one table that you also show where you say you exclude the new mines, but the number of observations stays the same. So I don't know what you mean by exclude. Do you just not 
is it just a zero or I, I don't know. And in the paper, at least, you, you interpret a lot of insignificant results, which I found a bit confusing. So you say there's a positive relationship, and, and then in the next sentence you say, but it's not significant, and then I say, well, then it's zero, I think. But it, I mean, that's a, just a very small thing. Okay. That's my thoughts. <laughs> but in general, yes, yeah, I said, I really, yeah, I really like it, and I think you've already uh, done a lot of things. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think I'll check if there are any more comments before I, I try to answer your question. Uh, is it possible to bring in the story of ethnicity here? I mean, to see like, you know, who, what particular ethnic groups dominated the particular areas you are focusing on? And also migration, because what we know in general is like, you know, criminality is not that related to his mining in South Africa, but criminality is more related to migration, because people from different other parts of Africa, mainly Nigeria and northern eastern part of Africa, moving to South Africa. And these guys are really creating lots of criminal issues in the South African politics. So can we really bring in these stories and see how they, uh, yeah, how your story would be? Is it, would it, would it change the story of your uh, thing saying that mining leads to lower levels of uh, criminality? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've seen the paper, uh, There Will Be Blood by Alex James and Brock Smith. So they do a very similar study but uh, across U.S. counties and look at if the U.S. fracking boom has impacted violent crime and they find really strong positive results. So I don't know if, the, what would explain the differences between South Africa and the U.S. Is it the level of development of the country or is it the labor intensity of, because in, in the U.S. it's gas and oil fracking in South Africa it's mining, so I don't know. Okay, so should I, any more questions or should I? Oh, okay, I'll, I'll uh, start with the last one. Uh, yes, I, I think I know the, the paper you're, you're talking about. I think partly uh, an explanation for that could be uh, the labor intensity, because if you compare South African mine to many of the, the other mining industries, they tend to be more labor intensive. So that might uh, drive the, the overall effect, but uh, otherwise, I'm not sure I, if it's the paper I'm thinking about. They uh, separate effects for uh, in periods when there's uh, uh, very weak institutions and periods when there are already some kind of established rule of law. And I think they don't find any effect when there's an established rule of law, but whereas they find these positive effects on violence when there's uh, no rule of law, right? So, so that might also be, be an explanation or looking at the contextual differences between what we are studying and that one. And then uh, turning to, to migration, I didn't address that at all uh, in the presentation here. We do have some, some tables on that. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have as detailed uh, migration data as we would have liked. Uh, the one thing that we can say at the moment, I think, is that uh, effects tend to be larger in high migration areas. Uh, the one interpretation we, we provide for that at the moment is that there might be uh, weaker uh, labor market ties for the migrants uh, at the, to, the, to the local level. So, so that's why we might see the, these larger effects, especially when, when the mines are, are, are closing down. In terms of ethnicity, uh, we haven't explored that at all, but it's possible we were, I, I know at the beginning of this project, we were uh, thinking about uh, investigating uh, differences between the different Bantustans in South Africa, for example, that might be uh, a road to go in order to, to, to look at heterogeneous effects, depending on that. Um, then to the discussions, comments about uh, the IV and the exclusion restriction, I think essentially we are uh, estimating the same kind of uh, effect. I mean, the, the reduced form is the same, so we're essentially just rescaling it to change the interpretation of the coefficient. But, but I, I mean, to some extent, I think I agree with you. Or is it 
So no, it's so it changes in uh, activity. So so it changes in activity between this uh, current year and the previous year. So we are using the same data. Yeah, yeah, at the nine level, yeah. Uh, and then uh, there is a, a comment on illegal mining. Uh, actually, at least we know uh, what a subcategory of our crime uh, variables that uh, illegal mining should be reported as. So we, we could uh, investigate the impact of illegal mining and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but what we can say is that is not driving our results. Our result in, in the last part of the paper, we have uh, specifications where we run, uh, run for all the different crime categories separately. Uh, and I, uh, the direction of those results are the same as, as the other ones. And I, the signs are very much uh, the same, irrespectively of what crime category we investigate. Uh, log of crime is uh, mostly to uh, uh, correct for skewness and just uh, facilitate the interpretation of the coefficient. Uh, yeah, and uh, in terms of the amount of tables, we should definitely yeah, try to condense the paper a little bit and uh, just focus it. I, I agree, but just for now, we want to want to show everything. Uh, that's what I could remember. Probably I, I forgot something, but we can check that later. Okay. Any more comments? All right, that's it for this session then, I think.